Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rewarding Explorations with Collectorables and Gatherables. Uh, my name is Leah Miller, and let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I've made a lot of MMOs. I worked on Dark Age of Camelot, which was one of the first-gen 3D MMOs. I worked on its spiritual su successor, Warhammer Online, and I worked on Wildstar. I've also done a bunch of research in this space on things like how location and population density affects gameplay in Pokemon Go, how gatherable density affects gameplay in PUBG, that kind of thing. I'm super interested in this subject. It's always been one of my favorite parts of game design. I've always wondered why people don't talk about it more. I had a formative experience when I was playing, wandering through this gorgeous woods in like 2002. Look at the top of the line graphics there. And as I was wandering along, I saw this like cool con construct thing wandering around. I'd never seen a monster like this before. As I went deeper in, there was a like bigger, scarier, more impressive one. Again, unlike anything else I'd seen in the area. Eventually, I came upon a tower that was so mysterious that I can't find uh, screenshots of it anymore. This was from 15 years ago, but it was gorgeous. And when I went inside, there was like obviously this factory where these constructs had been made and there was a secret tower. And I went up to the top of the tower and there was this mysterious bedroom that it looked like someone had been living in really recently. And in that bedroom, there was nothing, absolutely nothing to indicate what this place was, what had happened there, what kind of content took place there. I would never find out and I worked there. I asked my coworkers and they said, oh, one of those quests, but the quests in the area were sort of not highly relevant anymore. People weren't doing them. And so this gorgeous space that had been created and that had been really fun to explore had no payoff, had no reward. And while it's a good memory for me, I, can't find, I can find screenshots of these monsters because they're relevant to comment, content that's frequently done. I can't find any screenshots of that super cool tower. Breath of the Wild is the opposite of this. In Breath of the Wild, if you see something cool, there's almost always something there. If you, it teaches you as you play a visual language that suggests the presence of something. If you're wandering along really early, you'll see a rock that looks out of place lifted up one of your first Korok seeds. It teaches you to notice patterns. It teaches you to look for things. It teaches you that exploration is always valuable. And then later on, it gives you tools like treasure radar and other systems to allow you to sort of shape your own exploration and choose your own goals and outline your own motives. Uh, I've developed some terms for discussing this. Collectibles are finite in number and set in locations. There are checklists, which are items where the goal is to collect them all, basically, for completion's sake or to achieve a sub goal. Tomes are items that give you information about the world. Specific gear, which I know is the most generic label ever, is an item that always appears in a set place and there are a limited amount of them in the total gameplay. Gatherables are the other side of the coin. They're fungible resources that are theoretically infinite. You'll never not be able to get more wood or more tin. Um, advancement currency is things like coins or bonus XP, things that collecting them allows you to either buy upgrades to your gear, advance your character, that kind of thing. And then there's randomized lootables, which are the opposite of specific gear where you don't know for sure what you're going to get in them and their location is not fixed. And uh, the three tree Korok puzzles in Zelda are a perfect example of these working together. You're trained early on to see the bright red apples, to know that they're a resource. And then you see this visual language that you'll eventually learn is showing you a puzzle that will result in a Korok seed, which is a collectible, where there's a limited amount and you're trying to either reach a goal in how many you've collected or collect them all. This basically rewards exploration, draws the player's eye, and teaches them about the world. The opposite of this is this beautiful photo that I took while playing Pokemon Go. 
in the first iteration of Pokemon Go, going to a gym and keeping your Pokemon there for a long time was actually really valuable. So if you could find a gym that was in the middle of a park, like I would go out and hike there every two or three weeks and leave my Pokemon in this gorgeous place. The gym was called the Abandoned Mill, which is how cool is that? Ever since they changed their gameplay so that turnover is more important than longevity, now you only get coins from Pokemon not every day if they're there, but from when the gym turns over. This means that the more remote places are actually less good as targets now and have been heavily disincentivized. You've got to be careful when you make these changes to your economy because economy will motivate behavior. I used to make this hike every month, sometimes more often, and I honestly haven't been back since they changed the system. Everything is the economy. Every balance you make in where items are found, every balance you make in where content is found, will weigh on players' decisions, and they will always weigh it as if everything were a currency. Is advance, plot advancement is a currency. Leveling is a currency, exploration is a currency. Players will often do what is efficient rather than doing what they consider fun. They'll also, there's also a stigma sometimes against focusing too much on the kind of gameplay that is suboptimal for a particular game. If somebody's wandering around exploring, they're seen as less serious of a player if it's a game with competitive aspects. Wildstar actually had a big problem with this at launch. We wanted to set up a Plex-like system. Plex is EVE Online's uh, pay-to-subscribe model where players can buy subscriptions, put them on the auction house, and then other players can buy them for in-game currency. It works really well if players have a reason to want to get in-game currency. Wildstar's economy was rebalanced shortly before launch, and it removed multiple gold sinks which me meant that farming for gold was no longer an efficient enterprise. It was no longer a core part of what players were doing in-game. Because of that, several relevant systems became less relevant for players, and the cred system wasn't as strongly utilized as we had hoped. At the same time, people still like gathering. There's this really cool kind of love of the mix between gathering and more intense play. While there are plenty of total chill games, a lot of people will spend hours and hours working on something in Minecraft or, gather, or wandering around Monster Hunter and still like the punctuation of combat, even when most of the gameplay is gathering-centric. The balance between these is really important, and I don't think it's something we highlight as much because players will often not say, oh man, I'm looking for a game with really good gathering. But when they're given one, they'll really enjoy it. So I want to distinguish that last tweet had a good example of the interplay between collecting and gathering versus grinding. Uh, for me, collecting and gathering is interacting with static objects or entities placed in the world. Uh, action may be involved, but it usually doesn't imply violence. And rare monster spawning can leverage sim similar principles. If you're putting in rare monsters where the combat is not the point, you can still apply a lot of these design principles because it's really just finding an object to interact with, only in that case, you're interacting with your sword or whatever. I'm still gonna stick primarily to object-based gatherables here, but I just wanted to let you know in the, inc the increased applications. But why? Why do people like gathering? Why do people like this? There's a bunch of reasons. One is that it provides a way to socialize. A friend of mine used to uh, do ga data gathering based on WoW add-ons, and he found that people spent a huge amount of time doing mining and herbalism in WoW. He also had another one uh, add-on that saved chat logs and found out that people were really likely to combine herb herbalism and mining with chatting activities, with their social time. And like people who use their social time for gathering were actually more likely to continue playing than people who spent their social time dancing in the Stormwind Fountain or any of the other non-productive non uh, ways to engage with that. So this is my big point. 
gatherables and collectibles have, are more interconnected than any other aspect of game design. Other things may be the focus, and these are really, a lot of the times, the connective tissue in your game. You have to be aware of a lot of things when doing this placement. You have to be aware of combat in the area, story and characters relevant to the space, what the world and prop art is so that your things look appropriate and so that you're teaching players the rules of where to find things, and the economic and symbolic weight of the items that you're placing. And I wanna talk about how different principles of design apply to the different types of collectibles and gatherables. My favorite type of collectible and gatherable is the tome. This is basically holocrons, recorders in Bioshock, journal entries, those little hits of narrative and lore. For, for this one, you'll be collaborating a lot with narrative, but you'll also be collaborating a lot with art and world art and props. You can actually add a lot to the story and save the narrative designer some work by strategic placement of lore items. If a letter from a random scientist is just scattered on the floor, whatever, but what if it's in the desk of a rival scientist? That adds a layer to the story that would not be there by just placing an item in a slightly more strategic place. The big thing to be careful with about these, though, is not to halt flow. One of the biggest design no-nos if you're going to have narrative gatherables is to force the player to stop and read or listen to it right then. Um, you can have it follow them. There's an option that very few places have done, but that I'm in favor of, which is adding audio gatherables to a queue that you can then decide to play yourself during downtime. The next major type, oh, sorry. The next major type I want to talk about is checklists. Checklists covers a really wide array of different implementations. It's basically anything where collecting them all is the vital part, like the, the letters in Donkey Kong, or secrets like the orbs in Inside. I don't know if you guys have played Inside, but there's, it's this cool platformer, and in it, there are a few orbs. You'll probably run into like three of them if you play the game normally, but then you can play through multiple times, explore everywhere, and find them all, which leads to a secret ending. Quest items and checklists share a lot. And I don't always like to group them in the same thing, but it's important to draw that comparison because if you find a quest isn't working, that it's not satisfying or the story related to it isn't capturing people, you can convert it into a gatherable that rewards something less significant and less important, like an achievement or an optional item or a cosmetic. You can draw focus away from it, from making it ambient instead of the kind of necessity that implementing it as a quest gives it. The next type of collectible I want to talk about is specific gear, which again, very generic term, but it's when items are placed in a set place and you know where you're going to get them. You're going to get them in the same place in every type of playthrough and there's a limited amount of them. It can be a piece of equipment, a decorative item, or even just like a jokey fluff souvenir. If you run enough MMOs, you'll be amazed at what people keep. I know people have had vendor trash items from Vanilla Wow in their banks since whenever Vanilla Wow launched. What is time? It's uh, chests in old school Final Fantasy games are this type of uh, collectible. Metrovania's RPGs and games with RPG elements are the ones that are most likely to design gear acquisition around stuff like this. Now I want to move from collectibles to gatherables. The most common gatherable type is crafting materials. Like literally everything in Minecraft is a gatherable. Herbalism and mining nodes are the most common type in other genres. The best way to implement this is to use it as a way to teach players rules and make them feel smart. There's the rule that you have to dig to a certain depth to get diamonds. In other games, there are certain props around which certain other gatherables are likely to spawn. Like in Wildstar, we had these cool owl, owl statues and we had specific herbs and specific mining nodes that would be more likely to be found around the owl statues.
this is my this is the most sort of obscure gatherable type that people often don't think of as a gatherable. They think of it as its own thing. Advancement currency can be gold, experience, anything that you basically gather a lot of, like a near infinite supply, and use to advance your character. As you can see here, these are uh, advancement currency trails. There are two gold trails on the bottom, and then hovering sort of in the middle is a circle of XP nodes. This lets the player know that both of those trails are an option for where they can go in this sort of fast-paced downhill slide event, and also that there's a bonus for, hit, for making a jump. It teaches players mechanics, it shows them paths, and it does it with a resource that will pay off for them later. This is one of the types of gatherals people are most familiar with and most often encounter, since even the old Mario games would often show you hidden or alternate paths with coin trails. And the final category of gatherables I'm gonna talk about right now is randomized lootables. This used to primarily be in the form of treasure chests, but uh, PUBG and Fortnite have sort of revolutionized this variety by skipping the middleman and just putting them right out there. And this actually provides a way to reward observation, a way to reward visual knowledge, which is something we don't often see rewarded in this kind of game. It's also ways to give players an instant dopamine hit. They don't have to open the chest in order to see what's available. They can walk into a room and see that, as in this picture, there's a car 98 with a scope right next to it. Even if the player doesn't win, that's a huge victory dopamine hit you give them early on in their process. I wanna talk about when collectibles and gatherables fail. A lot of people find collectibles and gatherables tedious. They feel like completing them is too grueling. And if they're completionists, they feel like they have to 100% a game. And if you go too far with gatherables, then they get frustrated. There's also the famous problem when gatherables are incongruous, when somebody's wandering through a high-tech place and like half of the gatherables are magic orbs. You can be, try to be clever and end up being antagonistic. If somebody has a collection quest and every single other collection quest item has been on a floor or on a bookshelf and you hide one in the ceiling and that makes the player finish this level they spent a lot of time on with 99% completion, they'll get really frustrated unless you've taught them that that's how the game works. And economically unsupported is the most common problem I see. People will put a lot of work into coming up with gatherables and they don't end up being useful. You can spend all this time on herbalism and potions suck. So what constitutes a successful gatherable? The problem is that tastes vary. My brother and I really enjoyed 100%ing Donkey Kong uh, 64 when we were kids and a man recently tortured himself for charity for several days with how unpleasant he felt the experience was. So does Donkey Kong 64 have a good implementation of gatherables? It's impossible to say. You have to sort of tune for your audience and try to get to a spot where enough people are having fun with your gatherables and it doesn't feel as required for the people who aren't having as much fun. Gatherables are also good for rewarding different gameplay types. You can motivate people towards challenge by hide, hiding appealing items between behind gameplay, you can look into your player heat maps and put items where there's less player play, and you can tell the story, you can teach players and make them feel smart. I wanna look at an individual zone and talk a little bit about gatherables in shared spaces. First, before you're going to place things in a shared area, you have to know a bunch of things about that area. You have to know what the main route through the area is, where the mandatory quests are, where the alternate quests that will probably be popular are, where the safe routes are that don't have many mobs, where the, what the story is, and what the place's aesthetic is. Now I'm gonna do the most technical part of my talk. 
you have to know about hotspots, which are the places where there will almost always be a decent chunk of players. I've circled them on this map of Celestian here. They are the major quest hubs, and then over there on the east, you can see the transition between the major city and the rest of the zone. Those are places you know will always be high traffic. You can also see in yellow the other player paths. The map actually clearly shows you where players will regularly be walking. Now, these are the cool spots. There aren't many quests here. They require jumping puzzles to get to. The content there is optional or it's content that's limited. It's actually cool to put gatherables here as a way of, of intrinsically exploring, uh, rewarding exploration, but the problem is that you can then make it so that people who are playing the game in a less explorative manner don't get anything, and that's bad too. I want to talk about the ways into some central design principles about shared world spawn systems. This is my read from the slide part of the talk. Spawn groups are spawn points that are managed together. Spawn minimum is the lowest before a respawn is triggered. Spawn low is spawning is sped up. It's a threshold where if there are fewer than that number of items up, it'll be sped up. Spawn max is the maximum number of objects that are allowed to exist on a single spawn group. The example is I could have an herb spawn group that has 30 potential points where an herb could spawn. A new herb will show up every 60 seconds. If the spawn minimum is five, there will never be less than five herbs spawned. You can check for this a bunch of ways. You can have it check as frequently as your server will allow. You can have it check whenever an herb is gathered. It depends on your personal infrastructure. Um, low is 10. When there are fewer than 10 herbs spawned on this theoretical spawn point, a new herb will spawn every 30 seconds instead of every 60. The max is 15. This is a really important thing about implementing uh, gatherables in shared spaces. You almost never want to end up with a full spawn index. You want there to always be some variation where things are found. And of course, the optimal numbers and the way you set these things will vary a lot based on your individual design, your server structure, your population, all that stuff. Okay, now back to the good part. Uh, there are a couple ways to implement item spawns. This one is an illustration of discrete spawn groups. Every uh, colored dot shares a spawn group with all the other dots that share its color. They don't influence each other at all. There's no what is called spawn migration, which is when, because people more frequently interact with spawns in one area, the active spawns move to less populated areas. This is the other implementation, all spawns in a single group, which maximizes spawn migration. This is good because it will uh, eventually algor algorithmically reward exploration, but it's bad because after people have been playing in it for a while, as you can see, the hot spots have nothing in them. The places where players are more frequently, they're not just gonna find less, they're gonna find none. Because every time a herb spawns there and somebody collects it, it randomly rolls where else it can spawn. And you know, odds as they work out, eventually they'll be clustered in the cold spots, which is again, great for the people who go to the cold spots. When you go there, there's a huge bonanza, you feel super rewarded for exploration. So the best is a hybrid, and I'm sorry that this is confusing. This is actually a simplified version of what our spawn system looked like for Celestian, so you know what kind of stuff we're dealing with here. But the, the pink salmon -y on the left is one big spawn group, the violet on the bottom is a big spawn group, and the maroon on the upper right is a big spawn group. And then you'll see that the other colors, the cooler colors, are individual spawn groups in the specific areas. This way, there will always be, basically take that yellow group in the middle as an example. There will always be at least a couple herbs up there, but there will always also be a higher concentration in those more remote areas. And so this is sort of the aftermath of people being around there. As you can see, there's still significant clustering in the hotspots, but there's no place where there's just nothing. Every region has at least a little bit to offer, which is a good balance. Now I'm gonna move away from that and just talk a little bit, really quick a refresher on the different principles and how they're applied to the different genres. 
Platformers and nonlinear action games primarily use their gatherables to alert players to alternate paths, reward memory and backtracking. For instance, if you're wandering around and you see a piece of set gear in a Castlevania game and you can't reach it yet, you know that you can remember it and come back to it. That's a different kind of exploration and a different kind of reward, but it's really important. They can also challenge skills. If you see an item that you want and it's at the end of a really complicated jumping puzzle, that motivates you to do that puzzle. In RPGs and story exploration games, treat every space as a mini open world. If somebody is wandering through an old house, you might think that these principles don't apply, but they do, just on a smaller scale. You can also really leverage environmental storytelling in these kind of games. Like, the placement of items has huge impacts for characters. We actually often find characters, or find players and streamers telling stories about, well, why was there a chair in this bathroom? Or why was there a mystical jewel in the shoebox in this abandoned shoe store? People love making up their own little stories as to why, why things are in certain places. And also, there's always secret tunnel. Everybody loves finding a secret tunnel, even if it doesn't actually offer any gameplay advantage, even if it's totally missable, because good secrets are often missable. You still reward them by putting some gatherables or collectibles in there that are, that are non-essential. And more linear and narrow worlds, um, you have to be more careful to match the visibility of items and the difficulty of obtaining them to the play style that those items are compatible with. You shouldn't put narrative items between really intense content challenges because often the kind of people who are really just playing the game for narrative won't be able to do the content challenges. Um, one thing I like to do with hiding items be behind content challenges is to put an item that's really only usable by high-skilled players behind a high-skilled challenge. So if there's a cool item that like massively lowers your defense but raises your attack, something that only a skilled player would be able to get good use of, you can hide that behind a content challenge, make it visible so that players know that it's a reward for doing that, and it's a reward that is suited specifically to their play style. And one of the big provisos is only include completionist tasks if a game is designed for replayability. It's like that example I gave earlier where you hide one of your... Uh, one of your checklist collectibles in a really obscure place, players spent two hours getting through your level, gets to the end of it, and is at 99% and is super frustrated. If your game is designed to have people play through it a bunch of times and you know for a fact based on playtesting that people enjoy doing that, then go ahead and pull gags like that. That's fine. But if you really think that players are going to be mostly playing through it once for the story, be a little nicer to them. And this is sort of my lightning round things that don't fit on any of the other slides. People like secrets. Visibility is good, and you've got to decide how much visibility you want and keep it consistent. Like, a good example is the balloon challenges in Zelda, where they'll hide them somewhat, but they won't ever be completely hidden. Breadcrumb trails work. Everybody knows how they work. Everybody sees them and instantly understands them. Teach people where to look and do it early. Too many empty things is bad. If sometimes items are in barrels, but 99% of barrels are empty, people are going to be either stop looking in barrels or look at every barrels while getting increasingly furious with you as, you do, as they do it. The same thing as achievements. They're nice, but they can be compulsive. The number one complaint I get about gatherables is there were too many of them. I felt like they were unnecessary, and I want to get my platinum trophy. I'll never get my platinum trophy because of all those damn collectibles. And that's something you really do want to be conscious of because often the kind of people who are really valuing this sort of exploration and emotional engagement with your game, they aren't, they aren't the completionists, and some, sometimes the people who are really into your combat system won't want to do all of the exploration and you sort of have to weigh their respective wants and needs against each other. There are exceptions to all of these rules. 
I pointed out a few of them now, but it's sort of, this is a guide that you should follow some principles to keep in mind. You'll know when it's time to break them. But when you decide to break them, make sure you subject that aspect of your design to increase scrutiny and to increase player testing to make sure you haven't made something frustrating. So just play with it. Like, my favorite part of implementation is actually flying around a map looking for cool stuff that my artists have put in that I can enhance with the gatherables I put in there. I've actually been, not entirely, but somewhat ruined for MMOs because I'm used to being able to fly around, look at cool stuff, be the herb fairy, put everything in all of the cool nooks and crannies, and when I ha am trying to do that in real MMOs, I'm like, oh wow, there's a really cool tree, I wonder if it could climb it, C could climb it. Oh, it's full of wolves. Why are there wolves in the tree? I don't know, and it's disrupting my exploration experience. It's fun to place these, and if you don't find it fun to place these, see if there's somebody else at your studio who actually does enjoy this. Because I, you know, th this is a task that I often find when I'm doing consulting has been given to whoever didn't say not it when the task lists were given out. And it's something that especially people with interdisciplinary uh, interest in art and design or narrative and design are often really good at this task. So when you're looking to assign this task, when you're looking to volunteer for this task, know that those are kind of the skills that are, are shared between them. And I think this is a really cool design space because it's something that there are very few experts on this. And so you have a chance to innovate with this in a way that you might not have with some other systems that are a similar level of complexity. So go out there, explore, have fun. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter, email me, I will certainly tell you about this. Um, if you were colorblind and you could not see the details on that map really well, I apologize. Please email me. Um, I will try to upload them, some of the colorblind sensitive slides I've made, but they're less legible to everyone else, and <laughs> so, if you're interested in versions of this map that are designed for uh, teaching people who are colorblind to use these systems, please do get in contact with me. Uh, thank you guys very much. I don't know, how much time do I have for questions? Okay, we are out of time. Okay,